Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on cyclic AMP signaling. In this video, what we're going to look at is uh, phosphodiesterase enzymes. We're going to look at um, these enzymes in a bit more detail than we've ever looked at them before. So we're going to look at all the different types of phosphodiesterases that there are, and we're going to look at the reaction that they catalyze, and uh, we're going to look at two phosphodiesterases in particular, which is phosphodiesterase 1 and phosphodiesterase 4. Okay, so basically we'll start off with our discussion uh, by uh, looking at the reaction that all phosphodiesterases actually catalyze, which is this phosphodiesterase reaction. Okay, so let's start with our structure of cyclic AMP. So let's revise our structure of cyclic AMP. Okay, so the most difficult part of the structure is remembering the structure of the organic base adenine. Okay, so remember it's a six-membered ring uh, called a... Well, it's a purine ring ad adenine, but you start off by drawing this six-membered ring up here, which is a pyrimidine ring. And basically, a pyrimidine ring is just like benzene, except that... Uh, Two of the carbons have been replaced by nitrogens, and they have to be in these specific positions. So um, um, the, the nitrogens have to have a single carbon in between them, basically. So if I had one nitrogen here and then another nitrogen here, that would not be a pyrimidine ring. Similarly, if I had a nitrogen here and another nitrogen here, uh, then uh, that would not be a pyrimidine ring. Apart from that, it's the same as benzene, so you have... Um, these alternating single and double bonds. So this structure basically is known as a pyrimidine ring where you have these alternating uh, double and single bonds and you have those two nitrogen atoms replacing carbon atoms in those specific positions basically. Right, okay, so if you wanted to have a pure pyrimidine ring, then what you'd have is you'd have hydrogen atoms bonded to each of these four carbons. However, uh, in adenine, you don't have a pure pyrimidine ring. Adenine just contains the pyrimidine ring. So off of here, you have another ring structure called an imidazole ring. So off these two carbons, you then have two nitrogens coming off like so. And then from this nitrogen, you then have a double bond to a carbon, and that's why it's called an imidazole ring. Because when you have nitrogen doubly bonded to carbon in that way, that double bond, that well, that whole group is then known as an imide. Okay, so when you have nitrogen double bonded to carbon, that's an imide uh, bond, if you like. So this entire ring with carbon doubly bonded to itself here, and then nitrogens like so, and then the imide bond there. This is called an imidazole ring. So an imidazole ring is a five-membered ring. Okay, so the imidazole ring, so if I highlight it, if I get my highlighters, the imidazole ring basically is this five-membered ring here. The pyrimidine ring is uh, this six-membered ring that we started off with up here. Okay, and you can see that you've got a, both a pyrimidine ring and a puri, uh, and an imidazole ring, and they're both, they both contain the same atoms, basically. There are, there's an overlap. Um, so when you have a pyrimidine ring connected to an imidazole ring in this way, then uh, that is now known as a purine ring. So the entire structure is known as a purine ring, which is why adenine is said to be a purine. Okay, so now what we need to do is just finish everything off. So some of these bonds aren't, some of these atoms aren't fully saturated, so add on a hydrogen there to saturate that one. This nitrogen is going to be connected to our ribose, so we'll talk about that in a moment. This carbon has a hydrogen coming off it like so. And uh, then, specifically, adenine has an, am an amino group coming off this carbon. And I think that now is everything saturated, yes. So that's our adenine. So now, the purine ring with these specific three groups in those positions is then known as an adenine. So it's the organic base adenine. Okay, so we go from a purine ring to adenine. Okay, so now, off the, um, off the adenine, the adenine is attached to the uh, sugar ribose, and ribose is a five-membered ring. So here is five members here. Well, actually, it's a, it's a five-membered ring with another carbon sticking off it. So here's the five-membered ring, and then you've got a fifth carbon sticking off it like that. And then off this carbon, you have a hydrogen, 
And now remember it's ribose, so off this second carbon you have a hydroxyl group. Now if we're talking about deoxyribose, which is the basis of DNA, you don't have that hydroxyl group coming off the second carbon. And you have a hydroxyl group, oh, well, actually, well, you don't have a hydroxyl group coming off this third carbon, because actually that third carbon is now going to be linked to a phosphate group. So you have the oxygen still, but it's going to be linked to the phosphate group, because we are looking at cyclic AMP. So uh, forget that bit there. Right, and then to saturate that carbon, you have this other hydrogen. Uh, off this carbon, you have a hydrogen. Off this carbon, you have two hydrogens, and then you would have a hydroxyl group, but again, this is bonded to our phosphate, so this oxygen is then bonded to that phosphate, and then just complete the phosphate group, you have a double bond to oxygen, and then a single bond to another oxygen, like so. So that's the structure of cyclic AMP. Uh, so you can see we've got the adenine organic base here, our ribose, and then we've got this phosphate group making this cycle between the fifth and the third carbon of the ribose. To refer to that, often it's called free, part, free prime, five prime, cyclic AMP, to show you that the cycle is between the third and the fifth carbon. Okay, so that's cyclic AMP. Now, uh, when uh, you break down cyclic AMP, which is what phosphodiesterases do, they break this bond here, they hydrolyze this bond. So basically they take water and they use it to break that bond. So um, when you uh, break this bond, uh, what's going to happen is that one of these two is going to get the oxygen, and I think it's the phosphorus atom that gets the oxygen from here, and then the other one's going to be left without an oxygen. So basically what you do is you break up your water molecule, you give this hydroxyl group to the other one that didn't get the oxygen, and I think that's the carbon that doesn't get the oxygen, and then you give the hydrogen to the phosphorus atom basically. Okay, so uh, what's going to happen is that you get the molecule AMP, so we'll go through um, the structure again to draw out AMP, so another revision, test yourself, see if you can draw it out, so here's the pyrimidine ring, this alternating six-membered ring with alternating single and double bonds, uh, like so, uh, then we have up here our amino group, over here our hydrogen atom coming off there, and then down here is our imidazole ring, these two nitrogens, the imide bond, a hydrogen off there, and then this nitrogen is bonded to our ribose, so we'll bring that up. Um, here's our ribose, which is this five-membered ring with the oxygen up here, and then the final fifth carbon coming off the fourth, and then you have a hydrogen off here, a hydroxyl group because it's ribose, not deoxyribose, and now because we've hydrolyzed this bond, this carbon now has a hydroxyl group, so that's all very nice and a hydrogen, it's still got that hydrogen from up there, uh, then this has another hydrogen there, and now this uh, fifth carbon, it still has this phosphate group attached to it, uh, but now the phosphate group is solely attached to the fifth carbon, so we've broken it off down here, so now let's draw this phosphate group up here, here's our phosphorus atom, doubly bonded to oxygen, our hydroxyl group, and our O-, minus. so that structure there is adenosine monophosphate, or AMP. Okay, so cyclic AMP stands for cyclic adenosine monophosphate. We destroyed the cycle and we now have adenosine monophosphate. So I'll just write its name out adenosine monophosphate. And basically, adenosine refers to uh, the aden adenine organic base bonded to ribose. So that's what adenosine means adenosine monophosphate. And then, obviously, it's adenosine monophosphate because you've got a single phosphate group added to the adenosine group. Okay, so that's the reaction that our phosphodiesterases are going to catalyze, and it's called uh, the phosphodiesterase reaction. So this is the phosphodiesterase reaction, often abbreviated to PDE reaction. Phosphodiesterase reaction. Okay, right, so now let's have a look at the different types of phosphodiesterases. So there are absolutely loads of enzymes which can catalyze this phosphodiesterase reaction, and they're grouped into 11 groups, basically. So um, the initial grouping is that you put them into families, and you have basically the family phosphodiesterase 1, and basically you... Um, uh, PDE stands for phosphodiesterase. So there's a family of phosphodiesterase known as phosphodiesterase 1, and it continues on. You then have the family phosphodiesterase 2, 
phosphodiesterase free and it continues on. You go all the way down basically to phosphodiesterase 11. So right down at the bottom will be phosphodiesterase 11. Now these are not single enzymes and you want to stress that phosphodiesterase 1 is a whole family of enzymes. It's not a single gene that codes for a single protein. It's a whole family. It's a bunch of genes uh, which all code for phosphodiesterases that are similar enough to be put in a, simple, uh, a single family. Okay, so to emphasize that more, let me tell you that phosphodiesterase 1 family actually has three separate genes in. So uh, there are three genes, basically, that all are within the phosphodiesterase 1 family. And they all code for slightly different phosphodiesterase enzymes. All of the um, enzymes that they code for uh, are capable of catalyzing this phosphodiesterase reaction. And they're all very, very similar to one another, similar enough to be put in this same phosphodiesterase 1 family. Uh, but they are fundamentally different. They do have a fundamentally different sequence of amino acids. Okay, and we'll continue our discussion in the next.